Well, welcome back to another conversation. So today I've got with me William White, who is a composer, but also notably a vegan and antinatalist, and uh, has composed a piece um, about... I'm always, I always get his name wrong, but I'm just going to refer to him as Almari because I can never get the full name right. But everyone, I think, will know who I mean by Almari. Um, but maybe, Will, you can sort of like talk a bit more about him just for anyone who's uninitiated and doesn't know. But before we actually get into Almari, the piece you've composed, um, do you just want to go a bit into like about yourself, um, your background and like how you became vegan and antinatalist as well? Sure. Um, I am a classical musician. I'm a composer and conductor, and I live in Seattle, Washington right now. So I'm, I'm uh, born and bred in the United States. I was originally from Washington, D.C., and I remember being a kid, uh, there was some sort of, you know, minor vandalism in my neighborhood where mm. um, some kind of activist put one of those stickers on the stop signs that said, eating yeah. animals below stop. And uh, I think that was sort of a consciousness raising thing for me when I was mm. you know, about eight or nine years old. And I remember being explained to me um, what a vegetarian was, you know, by my mother when I was probably about that same age mm -hmm. and thinking that it just made a lot of sense. But, you know, I mean, I did not have the proclivity to kind of act upon that. No. Um, I, I didn't uh, change any of my habits until I was, I, I guess, a senior in high school uh, and I became a vegetarian for a couple of years dropped off of that. Uh, and then it was about, I don't know, 10 years later, I think I was in my, my late twenties that I became a vegan. And if I'm being honest, I mean, it was not, it, it wasn't not motivated by animal welfare. I mean, mm. um, you know, I, I had always had this idea in my mind that that was like a good thing. Um, in spite of the fact that there, so much of what you get told from society is uh, sort of belittles that. Mm. But um, it was really because I was like doing a lot of yoga and I was hanging out with these yoga people and they were just <laughs> sort of into like woo woo whatever. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, there was a general idea that veganism was was good. And so I had a friend um, with whom uh, we, we decided to go vegan and uh, he sort of fell off the wagon not long thereafter, but I stuck with it. And then, of course, you know, I mean, I think of veganism as being a uh, a process rather than like a, a destination. You know, it's it's something that you have to to learn about. And to me, it's like, you know, I th through being vegan for these kind of, I guess you would say more health or spiritual reasons, uh, then you come to really learn what veganism is that, you know, it's mm. this kind of boycott it's a uh, it's it's an ethical stance that you know it, it's an ethical stance that there's a diet downstream mm. of and then mm. you start to learn about like you know what vegan clothing is and you know why you have to read like uh, every ingredient list down to the <laughs> you know to the minor points of detail because you know they're crushed up bugs in your food dyes and that you know there, there's all sorts of things that you know we mm. just have to constantly be learning about um, in order to be a vegan. And to me, being a vegan is like, what, what it means is that, you know, you might not know something, right, when you're at various points along your vegan journey. But once you learn something, you incorporate that into your, mm. um, into your daily life and your practice. And so that's just been a process. I mean, I've, I think I've been vegan for about, I don't know, 11 or 12 years now. And um, the antinatalist thing, that's more recent. But uh, once again, it's like, I, I think that it was always very natural, very uh, instinctive and intuitive to me that um, it, it, it would be better not to bring people into the world. Mm. I mean, I remember I remember even in my mid 20s sort of uh, talking to some friends and they, you know, just sort of suggesting this and, and they would be very, um, you know, get get their uh, get their hackles up. <laughs> and, um, but to, to put a name to it, to put a word to it, I think that I, that's only happened for me in about the last five years or so. And, mm. uh, in that time I've done a lot of reading and a lot of studying and, um, yeah, I don't know. It just, it just mm. seems very obvious to me. And what, what, what made you sort of put a label to it? Was it that you just didn't know about the label before or did, did you see something that sort of made you more strong in, in your stance? You know, I, I really can't remember specifically. Um, I, I don't remember where I first came across the term. Uh, mm. But at some point in the last five years, 
I learned it and I read a lot about it. I, I sort of delved into um, into the works of David Benatar mm. and, you know, I came across al -Mari. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it might have even been because of al -Mari that I found out about it because, mm. you know, I mean, I, I came across this great vegan poem. It's like sort of his most famous poem that gets yeah, yeah. You know, sprinkled around these various dark corners of the vegan internet. And then it's like if you if you pursue that at all, then you find out about his antinatalism, mm. and and that might have been really my introduction. But I, I, I genuinely don't remember. Mm. So talking of Almari, you did a beautiful segue for me there. So talking of Almari, um, you've written this piece uh, called Concerto for Chorus, and. Before we get into that, just so people don't know, so it's a classical piece, um, and maybe you would define it in a more specific way um, that I'm unaware of, but I would just refer to it as classical. Um, but before we get into the actual piece, do you just want to go into a bit of like how you got into classical music? Was it something that your sort of parents sort of pushed you toward or nudged you towards, maybe not push, but like nudged you towards as a kid, or is it something you picked up yourself and... Yeah, sure. Uh, no, my, my, I do not come from a musical family at all. My parents had very little interest or understanding in it. Mm. And um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just, it's not to say that my parents disliked, but I mean, they both um, had sort of a, I don't know, a, a very light interest in it. And my mother had some tape sitting around the house when I was a kid and I, I somehow got interested in them. And um, I, I was able to choose an instrument to play when I was about eight or nine years old in elementary school. And uh, I chose the viola, which is like mm. a larger violin. And uh, I, I, you know, just through school classes and school orchestra and stuff, I, it, something lit a fire under me. I mean, something about it just just caught me. And mm. then I was off to the races, and um, and and I have been ever since. So it is it is just a deep, personal, abiding love and passion. I mean, it's it's my main uh, thrust of my life. Mm. yeah like i i really like hearing that stuff about people because like honestly i listen to i think i'm gonna say something that you hear so many people say but i listen to a lot of music but i'm just so unmusical or untalented in actually being able to like create it um so it's like nice to hear when you know there's someone else who you know when you speak to someone who can actually like produce the stuff that you love listening to and i've really not listened to a lot of classical music and when you um, when you sent me the, uh, your piece over, mm -hmm. um, and this is what I was referring to before we started to record. So when you first sent it over, I thought, I don't know what your experience has been with sort of like online vegan antinatalist things, but sometimes, you know, someone is so passionate about the topic mm -hmm. and they put it into an art form that they're also passionate about, but because they're so passionate about the topic, they then just send around something they've created which sometimes i don't want to be harsh but like isn't very good mm -hmm. um and so i sort of like you sent it to me and because i've had that experience before that was my initial thing and then when i opened your um like the youtube video and it started to play i was like oh shit this is actually like really good <laughs> i like i like i like genuinely really like it um and i've sent it to a few people since then and they're like looking forward to hearing like this uh discussion because i've said i was going to talk to you um oh, wonderful. yeah i yeah That's yeah I, I i've really liked it but so you said you called it concerto for chorus and you referred like before we started recording you, you said there was maybe like a small story behind that name why, why did you why did you call it that well, this is going to get maybe a little bit into the weeds um, more than uh, your viewers will will care to. I don't know. I mean, unless they really are interested in in the contemporary choral music. But um, mm. one of my favorite composers is a uh, a Russian twentieth century named Alfred Schnitka, and he wrote a piece called Concerto for Chorus uh, in I think it was probably nineteen eighty five. Mm. And what I always thought about that piece was that it's it's a very dark musically, but if you read the text, which is from like, I don't know, some 12th century Georgian monk, um, it's, it's sort of uplifting. Like it's, you know, it's about like God is this and that and isn't yeah, that great. Yeah. Um, and so I, I always find that disappointing because like the music is so, you know, like I say, it's just so dark. It's, it's kind mm. of bleak. And I love that about it. And so I always thought, gosh, I would love to write something that is sort of in that same mold, but that, you know, where the text matches the, the darkness of the music. Mm. 
And then when I uh, when 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 I found this Almari poetry, I thought, oh wow, you know that could be what I was looking for 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 my idea for a concerto for chorus. It's not a term that is commonly used. It goes mm. back uh, in the Russian Orthodox Church tradition to the 17th or 18th centuries. And basically, in in the Western European sense, when we say concerto, that usually means like a piece for a solo instrument and an orchestra. Uh, so like a Brahms violin concerto is, you know, a violin playing with a big orchestra behind. Mm. And that's like they're backing them up They're You know, that's the accompaniment. Um, but the, the word was originated in like the, I don't know, early 16th century in Italy. Mm. Um, and it just means a concerted effort of musicians joined together. Mm. And so in, in Western Europe, that sort of it, it took on this instrumental quality. But then that concerto, just the term got originally it was for singers and instruments. And for some reason, the singing quality went over to the Eastern European side. And mm. then in the church, they just thought, oh, well, this is anything where it's like a, a kind of concert piece or like an extended piece, usually based on a psalm uh, that, that, that a group of singers would sing together in the Russian Orthodox Church. And then Shnika kind of pulled that term out of um, out of its historical context to just give it this broader sense of a large work in many movements for an a cappella choir. So mm. I, I hope that wasn't too, um, uh, you know, I hope, I hope anybody finds that remotely interesting, but there you have it. Uh, so, um, so that's the name, but mm-hmm. the actual song, so, uh, or, or the piece is in total 20, around 25 minutes long, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so can you I, I will obviously link the song or the, the piece um, like in the description. So anyone who wants to can go and like, listen to it. Please. Um, but can you give us sort of like um, can you just yeah tell us about the song like the sure. you know how you came up with the music how you you know you said it's it's based on poetry by Almari. Like why did you pick those specific pieces like that sort of stuff. Yeah. OK. So. I found the, uh, you know, like I said, I found that first kind of famous vegan al Ma'ari poem that's like, you know, mm. don't eat fish, don't eat meat, don't steal the the honey from the bees because they mm. didn't make it just to give it away. And I was like, wow, you know, it's just, I mean, you can find vegetarian stuff going back to the ancient Greeks, but to find like a real vegan propaganda, yeah, yeah. I mean, that as far as I, anybody knows, I think that's the earliest. And mm. this is from about the year 1000 in Syria. And so I just got very interested in this. And, and so I, I, I got a, a first edition of the original translations of those poems, which was oh, done wow. by a, uh, it's, it's from the early 1920s. And it was done by sort of an Orientalist scholar, a British guy um, who translated extensively a lot of Almari's stuff um, uh, from the Luzumiat, which is his main work. And so I got that book, which you can read. It's it's on archive.org. I mean, you can read, the, you know, for mm. free um, o- online. And so I was just reading these poems. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this stuff is amazing. And then, but, you know, the, the, the translations are very, um, they're sort of recherche, if, if you know what I mean. They're like sort of dense. They use weird vocabulary. They have like a, a an old affect to them. And even still, the Almari came through, like the ideas came through. But I just kept wondering, I was like, I wonder if there are better translations out there. Hmm. And through a friend here in Seattle who is a, a, a linguist, a, a linguistics professor, I said, do you know anybody who works on like, you know, middle medieval Arabic or anything like that? She goes, no, I don't know anybody who does that. But I know the person who would know somebody who does. And she sent this request to her friend and he goes, oh, yeah, I know the exact guy. And so she it's so her friend put me in touch with um, this young Arabic scholar who teaches at Brigham Young University. And I don't know if that means anything to you, but that is like the the capital of Mormonism in the United States. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I mean, you a place where you would never even guess that they have an Arabic department. Right. <laughs> so I write this cold email to this guy and I just say, you know, I have a request from a composer. Uh, I understand that you work on Almari and other like, you know, early Arabic um, uh, texts. And, uh, you know, I, I'm interested in sending some of this stuff to music. And I am just wondering, can you tell me um are these translations the best that is out there? Are there any other options, you know, or what, what do you think of these? And he wrote back with so much enthusiasm. 
he was t- he told me that like you know this is an amazing uh, request you know I, I've devoted my life's work to studying al Ma'ari and the idea that somebody would like to you know musicalize it is so interesting to me and it just so happens that I too am a poet and a translator and if mm. you'd like to collaborate I'd be really interested and I was like oh my god like you can't you could couldn't have asked for a better response I mean I I didn't even know that somebody would write me back right yeah yeah yeah. So he wrote back so enthusiastically, and I said, well, yeah, if you want to collaborate, let's work on it. Um, it turns out that this guy, his name is Kevin Blankenship, and he is extremely talented, extremely mm. talented. Now, what's you know, we, we had a couple of Zoom uh, meetings where I, I just sort of picked his brain about al I was like, you know, where, where did he come up with this stuff? You know, I mean, like, it, it, was it part of his culture? Was it anything? I mean, because he traveled to, he was from Syria. He traveled to Baghdad. Um, and, and, and so Kevin said that like, there's a chance that because Baghdad was such a, a, a cosmopolitan city that maybe there was some influence from like the Indian subcontinent there. And so there might've been some kind of Hindu, Buddhist, Jainist, mm. um, influence that he picked up, but he said more likely than not, he just sort of like, you know, figured it out on his own mm. that he just came to these conclusions and um, so I found that all very interesting. Now, Kevin, I should say, is like, it's so fun. I mean, like he's he's a practicing devout Mormon guy. I think he has like five kids. He does. He is not vegan. He is definitely not anti-natalist. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and yet he produced these translations of the text that to me are so immediate and so um, poetic. And, and the thing that he did that I thought was really smart, as opposed to like the earlier translations, was he, he threw out the idea of trying to like, capture the uh the meter of the poetry or the scan or the rhyme scheme he just Mm. made it into very modern poetry and he captured the essence of it i think so much better than the old translations and the other thing that i really like about his work is that um the translations that he created are they're sort of like they're good lyrics because in a, in a lyric, you need space to let the music sort of fill it in and lift it up. Mm. You know, I mean, if it's too dense, it just doesn't work. And so I just thought that these were extremely good lyrics. So the way that we did it was um, it's kind of interesting in that old uh, translation in that book. Uh, every poem has a number. And at the end of the book, all the poems are given in their original Arabic. So I would read the poems in their old translations. I would send him the number. And then he would look at the Arabic and he would write new translations. Mm. And he probably translated about 20 poems that I asked him to. And from that set of 20, I narrowed it down to seven, which end up in the completed work. Mm. Um, And and I wanted to um, kind of try to touch on the major themes of al Ma'adi's work. And 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 encapsulate them as much as I could. Actually, I, I used I ended up using eight poems, but two of them I condensed into one movement. Yeah. Piece. Yeah. So um, why did you pick those specific poems? Was it because you thought those best captured the sort of main arcs of his work? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I knew that I wanted to have um, something that was vegan. So, I, you know, the, he, the, the, my, my piece includes the famous vegan poem. I mean, famous mm. point, you know, <laughs> we're, we're really talking in relative terms. I mean, <laughs> when you said at the beginning of this, uh, of this chat that, you know, everybody will know Almari, it's like, wow, you've got, you've got a very well-informed audience here. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the, the, the sort of central vegan poem that is the thing that most Westerners at least know him for, I wanted to use that. Uh, mm. I wanted to have an anti-natalist thing in there. Um, I wanted to have something about his sort of, um, he, you know, Kevin tells me that he was not atheist, but he was very much anti-clerical, anti-clerical and sort of a skeptic of, mm. of received wisdom of religion. So I wanted to have something in there about that. Um, there's there's a, a movement that's sort of more about like kind of anti-natalism from an environmentalist perspective. Um, which I thought was good. So yeah, uh, just just I wanted to capture as much of that as I could and as little as I could. But then there's some stuff with Al Ma'ari where he's um, he's trying to like show off his learning. Like he talks a lot about like the uh, uh, the Pleiades. You know, the, the what what are those called? The um, the star uh, the um, constellations. The constellations. He's always yeah, talking yeah. about constellations, and because that was like very much part of like you know the kind of um, the Greek world, you know, he's show, he's trying to show that he has learning mm. of like ancient Greek philosophy and and Arabic and, and Islamic philosophy and and this and that and the other. And it's like, well, that that I'm less interested in, you know. Mm. 
Yeah, and when when we were like organizing a time for this, I made the mistake of thinking that you uh, were in London. Yeah. And it was because when I was um, when I was listening to the piece, I was looking down in the in the description, and it said that you recorded it in Hampstead, in London. Yeah. How did that come about? If you're born and raised in Seattle, and, and you're sort of presumably living there permanently, how comes you recorded it in London? Well, there are a few reasons. I mean, I. Uh... <clears throat> After I wrote this piece, uh, w- this piece was a passion project. Nobody asked mm. me for this piece. Uh, <laughs> nobody like commissioned it. Nobody paid me any money for it, anything like that. And I, I have to admit, I-, I still have skepticism that it's going to like have much of a performance life um, mm. because when people go to, you, you said you don't know much about classical music. I'll, I'll just tell mm. you about classical music, choral music in particular. When people go to a, a choral music concert, they want to hear like... Um, you know, Christmas carols and like little, you know, um, <laughs> things that are like, you know, really beautiful and, you know, uplifting and stuff. They're, they're not looking for this. And yeah, so yeah. I thought to myself, you know, I, I really believe in this piece. It's very important to me. Like, like this is definitely the most personal piece I think I've ever written. Mm. Um, and I wanted to bring it into the world somehow. And I just thought, you know what, I, I'm, I'm just going to have to do this myself. Mm. And so um, I, I started setting aside a fund, uh, you know, from my savings to say like, okay, well, I've got to record this. I've got to just produce this on my own and just because I wanted to be in the world. And I've, I have self-funded uh, recording projects in the past. And you always try to do it on the cheap. You try to like scrimp and save and, you know, uh, make it as economical as possible. But I just thought, you know, this is really my one shot with this piece. Mm. I need to make it as good as it possibly can be, and I need to spend the money that that's going to require to do it. And, you know, because I'm a musician, I know about like the international scene. And the fact of the matter is that the best singers in the English speaking world are in London. I mean, it's just no comparison. Mm. Uh, And I have a friend who is a freelance singer in London. And I said, you know, do you know anybody who sort of like contracts choirs and puts this kind of project together? And she said, yeah, I know the exact person. And so I, I, I had a conversation with him and uh, he found really the A team, as he called it. He, he, he got like the best singers, not actually just in London, but from across the UK, people who frequently work in London, but they might live, mm. you know, uh, parts all over. And uh, we all gathered together uh, over the course of two days this past summer. Uh, it was in late July. And, and I flew to, the, to, to London and uh, conducted the choir for, and rehearsed them and put, put together the session. We got, to, we got an excellent engineer and a producer. And um, yeah, that's why. It's because th- th- there was no better place to do it. And so I just thought, mm. well, it's worth it. And I love going over to Europe. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. So, yeah. So, th- it, so it, it, I maybe can guess the answer, but I'm assuming then, so if it was your sort of passion project and then the sort of outside help you got you sort of ap- apart from the guy who was doing the translating for you i think you said his mm-hmm. name was kevin yeah apart from him it sounds like the other people you kind of um contracted so they came on to do it as like a, a job sort of thing that's right so what apart from you were there any other vegans or antinatalists involved in the making of the song no there was there was one young lady in the chorus who told me that she had been vegan and that this piece made her feel very guilty um and i was <laughs> like oh, okay well maybe maybe you'll get back on the on the train there yeah. um but no and you know that was a concern of mine too i mean that was another reason that i wanted to go to london to do it was because you know i if i had found singers to do it here that would be people who i work with and see very um often yeah And they would think that I'm nuts. You know, it's like, (laughs) go to London. I'm never going to see these people again in my life. Um, Although I have to say, I got very, I I didn't, there was no resistance. People were very happy. I mean, this was an unusual project. And I think that it Mm. sort of probably piqued a lot of people's uh, intellectual curiosity. Mm. Um, But, you know, nobody was like, what are we doing here? I mean, of course, I was Mm. the one paying their paycheck. So um, (laughs) if they felt that way, they didn't tell me. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a piece that I'm, uh, I don't know, I'm reluctant, you know, e- even though I feel so strongly about it, I'm sort of reluctant to uh, share it with mm. uh, so many people in my profession. Although now I'm starting to, I don't know, I have shared it around a little bit. I'm starting to get bites from some mm. of actually the more prominent um, 
choral organizations, at least in this country. Mm. And so uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens with it. When you, when you say bites, what do you mean? Is in that's a good thing or a bad thing? No, it's a good thing. It's like there, there's some interest in them, uh, oh, in them okay. like programming and performing the piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I, I, I totally get where you, uh, where you're coming from with like not wanting to share it in your more personal circles because it's like it contains two very <laughs> controversial like points of view. One way more controversial than the other one. Yeah. And you know, I, I get like it can. It's one of those things that can burn like personal bridges you have, and you don't know how people are going to react. And so, if you were going to do it with either strangers or people you know. And you know the strangers can do a very good job. Like I would have gone with the strangers as well, to be honest. Exactly. You know, it's so yeah. funny. I was watching. I was watching your video um, where you interviewed the uh, young man who's uh, was talking about um, effective altruism, and he yeah. said that uh, he he didn't like putting on labels because that labels were all about social cues, and you know you're just trying to make friends. And I was like, buddy, when has anybody ever made friends <laughs> by claiming to be either vegan or anti-natalist? It, it doesn't happen. I pr promise you that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so you were saying that, like, when you were recording in London, you were maybe expecting, or I don't know if you used the word expecting, but you, you maybe thought that there was maybe going to be some sort of disquiet in, in the chorus because of the, you know, because of the topic or whatever. But you said that you were kind of pleasantly surprised. So I'm assuming that, like, basically everyone that was contracted to work on the piece and help in the recording, I'm assuming, like, they're not idiots. They probably knew what the messages coming out of the poetry was. So um, did you have any like um, interactions with them or conversations with them about veganism or antinatalism that stick in your mind of positive conversations that you had with them? No, I didn't. I didn't. I did. The, the topics never really came up to be mm. quite honest. I, I made sure I that I was very clear with everybody involved about what was going on beforehand. So when I um, had my first couple meetings uh, just across Zoom with this guy who was going to be hiring the chorus, I said, you know, you just might want to have a little bit of sensitivity to this, um, mm. that, you know, people might have to have a little bit of um, uh, thick skin, <laughs> you know, mm. or, or that if, if they might be offended by anything, you know, just just be careful about that. And mm. they all had the music well ahead of time. It's not like they were just showing up and looking at it for the first time. So so they knew what they were getting into. Um, mm. But aside from that one young lady telling me that she had been vegan at one point, uh, we, we really didn't talk about that. I mean, you know, we, I, I had very interesting conversations with the musicians, but it was all much more about like, what's the difference between being a gigging musician in the UK versus the US and mm. what kind of music that they usually do and and, and projects and stuff like that. But um, no, the actual, uh, I, I tried to be self-deprecating about it too. Like, you know, one of the, one of the pieces is called um, You Are Ill in Your Mind. And mm. I would say like, or, or, you know, there's one that's like, uh, uh, you know, it's like I'm I'm wasting away, and I said to them, you know, oh, this will be the hit single from this album, you know, <laughs> um, and and I told them at the beginning of the project, I said, you know, look, I'll, I'll just be very clear from the beginning, you know, this is a passion project. It's very strange. I understand mm -hmm. that, um, and I, I just want you to know that as pessimistic and as dark as this text is. I'm really a happy, lucky, go lucky guy. You're mm. not trapped with like a suicidal, suicidal maniac for the next 48 <laughs> hours. Um, so I was like, you know, we're going to make this as positive and, and fun of an experience as we possibly can. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm kind of similar in that way to you. I think like if someone judged me based on like my views, yeah. they would think I was an utterly depressed person. But like day to day, I'm quite like... Um, uh, what would you call it? Like I was gonna say sunshine and rainbows, but that makes me sound like a bit weird. Like op not optimistic, but like you know, positive. Day -day. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even David so, Benatar says that, like you know, uh, you, you can't just dwell on this stuff. You know, once you've mm. once you've had your eyes open to like the total pessimistic hellhole mm. that the, the universe is, you can't just dwell on it all the time. You know, you have to enjoy yeah. life. Yeah, I think having a sunny disposition, if you can, you know, some people, I guess they're so overwhelmed by things that they can't, but if you can have a sunny disposition, I think it's better for you, you know, like, obviously, you know, you're on this ride as well. So, it, you know, you might as well try and have a good time. Um, so it's better for you. And also, it probably you come off better to other people as well. Because like, 
if you are very sort of like low, um, moody is the wrong word, but I'm going to use it anyway, sort of person, I think that would kind of put people off, you know, because humans are like that. Like humans don't just listen to what you're saying. They see who's saying it and how they're saying it. And that influences as well. Um, so we, we've spoken a bit about like, um, you know, how it was all received by people you actually worked with, but what was the reception like from like a wider audience? And, and you were saying as well that you didn't really want to share it around, at least in your personal circles, but where did it get released to? Was it, did you share it in, you know, are there sort of like professional circles that you share it in that have nothing to do with your sort of personal life or, Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, it, it it hasn't really been widely received as of yet. I mean, it's just I I only put it out a few days ago, and I just put it on my YouTube channel. You know, I mean, that's mm. it. It's just freely available on YouTube. Now, with the British folks, um, we we have a few ideas about maybe trying to get it um, attached to a label, and you know, actually released on a commercial CD. Uh, that was never my goal. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it mm. doesn't. Um, I, I could, you know, see many reasons why it would not happen. Mm. Uh, but, you know, um, yeah, I have, I have shared it with a few close friends who knew that I was working on it and a few colleagues, um, to, you know, sort of gauge their interest. And the, the other thing about the piece is that like from a musical point of view, it's hard. Like it's, it's like a hard thing to, to sing, like not, not just any average choir would be doing it. Like it, it sort of needs a professional uh, mm. performance and and most choirs in in certainly in the United States and even more broadly are not professional um, singing organizations so I, I think that maybe in terms of like its reception in the musical world it's like I say I've sort of had some interest from some of those higher level groups because I think that they're sort of uh, they're tempted by the challenge maybe yeah, yeah and so that's that's the road that I'm pursuing there Um but then, you know, in terms of putting it out into the world, like I, I, I put it on Reddit, you know, in, in like the vegan antinatalist subreddit. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm sharing it with people like you who, who I, I, I mean, I, I wrote this piece more so for the, uh, the people who I thought would be receptive to the philosophy mm. and who are interested in that side, who are interested in Amari rather than um, people who would necessarily be interested in the music, even though I gave my best efforts to writing the music. Mm. And I think that musicians should also find it interesting. And hopefully uh, some of the ideas will, will sort of get into them just by by listening to it out of their interest mm. musically. But um, yeah, it, it hasn't had so, so much of a wide reception yet. But the the people who, who, who I, I, you know, care about their opinion have had very high regard for it. Mm. yeah have you um have you shared it in the or m maybe you're not even in the there's a big um it's like the sort of main english speaking antinatalist facebook group i think it's got like ten thousand people in have you shared it in there no uh -uh. I, I don't do uh, much of it. i mean i'm on facebook but i don't do much on it so um uh, well i mean I will, the when I, I'll, I'll, dry, I'll drop it in yeah 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 definitely do like I, when like i when I publish a video, I always just share it in there. So like I, when I share this video, I will share the link to the, the, the piece as well. But, um, definitely I think it would be worth you sharing it in there because if, if you, the person who composed it shares it, mm -hmm. you know, you'll just people commenting on it and stuff, you'll see more directly like their thoughts, but also like, if you want to, you can engage with them and stuff rather than doing it on something that I've posted or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I would definitely encourage you to like, um, like, I don't know if there's any sort of reservations you have about sharing it in antinatalist circles in any way, but I would definitely encourage you to share it around because I, I think, um, I think like, I think Benatar is probably like the sort of, you know, everyone's sort of like golden boy or whatever for antinatalism, but Almari is definitely up there as one of the sort of big, uh, philosophers or figures that people, um, you know, associate with the philosophy and whose work they appreciate. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like people would, you know, really like to hear it. So I would encourage you. Yeah, no, that, I mean, in so many ways, that's the target audience, um, is, is the anti-natalist community. And, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, I, I am in some of these anti-natalist spaces online. Um, but you know, it's like, I don't have that much to add to the discussion until I did this. Mm. And now I think that mm. this is uh, something that I really have to add and that is very unique. And at the, at the very least, because of these new um, translations of the poetry. 
mm. which I think are so phenomenal. And I mean, you know, reading Benatar, I mean, it's good. It's great. I mean, I like his works a lot. But, you know, I mean, he gets into fairly technical, philosophical stuff. Mm. Almari, yeah, how can like, you write a song based around that? Yeah, you would never do that, right? I mean, that would just be like, <laughs> you know, it just wouldn't work. But Almari is like, direct to the soul. And mm. now with these new translations, there, there, there's nothing else that comes close, I think, in terms mm. of the the power of the message um, in such a concise form. So yeah, I, I that that's why I made two video versions of this. Like when I publish my stuff as a composer on YouTube, I, mm. I, I include the sheet music, you know, because it's mainly mm. for musicians. But in this, I made a video that's just plays the the mm. actual text as it goes so people could just read that if they're not interested in music at all mm. so yeah, yeah. No, i will take your advice and, and post it you were saying that like there's new translations of some of his poetry because of the like this piece that you've been working yes. on with kevin right mm -hmm. so and you said that i think he translated 20 right and then only seven slash eight were used mm -hmm. is there anywhere people can go online to actually see all of the new translations well, you know, uh, th there isn't. Um, I mean, I mean, I can send them to you if you want, but uh, it's, you know, it's his work, of course. Mm. And I have encouraged him so strongly to translate like the full Luzumiat of, of Almari, mm. or at least to, 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 to come up with a, a small book's worth of translations. Mm. Uh, because I think it would do very well. Like I could see it at, uh, I, I don't know if you guys have like Urban Outfitters in the UK. Do you know what that yeah, is? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like at one of those book tables of Urban Outfitters, right? Where they have all these weird books that are sort of like, mm. you know, eye catching and stuff. This would sell like wildfire, you know, if there was mm. a slim volume of his poetry um, that, that, you know, retailed for like $10 or 10 pounds or something. And he is interested in that. I think that he's pursuing that idea but, you know, he's got a lot of other stuff on his plate. I mean, he's a full-time yeah. academic. He's teaching, you know, basic Arabic classes. He's uh, working on all of his scholarly stuff. So he's, I, I don't think I've quite lit the flame under him that I wish I could, because I would love for these poems to be out there in that kind of a, uh, a format. And mm. I'm just hoping that eventually he will um, get around to it and find a publisher and really, you know, have some oomph behind it. Because yeah, like I say, I think he's, he's very talented. So, mm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Kevin, if, if you ever watch this, um, like I know there would be a lot of people that would be really interested in like reading any translations that you've already done or like may do in the future. So there would definitely be, even if it doesn't make it to urban outfitters, like there would, <laughs> there would be an audience for it. Um, so this obviously this piece you know you were saying there are other key themes but two of the key themes are like veganism and antinatalism which is you know Almari speaks about both of them have you ever worked on any um like musical projects to do with either veganism or antinatalism before that that weren't this one or do you plan to do any more in the future yeah i mean it's um it's it's sort of hard to do in a way but yes i have uh i found I read this book uh, that was all about the history of vegetarianism, mm. and um, it, specifically in Europe. And I found some, ah, gosh, I think it's like early 19th century uh, hymns by a, a, a vegetarian, a British vegetarian sort of like Methodist offshoot sect. And so there were three uh, texts for hymns, and I don't think that they had ever been set before. So I just wrote some hymns um, to mm. go with these, and I published them for free on my website, just saying, like, if any church, you know, wants to, like, take me up on these, like, go ahead. If you're a vegetarian church out there that wants, you know, some some things for your congregation to see, yeah, to yeah. sing. Um, and then one of those hymns I developed into a more extensive song, like like a song of that just, like, I played on piano and sang. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting text. So, mm. uh, so that was like the pre that, that was, you know, kind of working me up to this larger project on these themes, but, um, it's something that I want to pursue. I mean, you know, I, I, as I get older, I think I'm bringing a little bit more of my personality and my, my personal philosophy into my work as a musician. Mm. But of course, you know, there's lots of other stuff that I believe in that I'm interested in and that, you know, even on the musical side that doesn't have to overlap with this. Um, and it's, it's a little bit hard. For, I mean, this is like, this is sort of like my main statement in this genre. And, and like, I, I can't 
think of too much else that I really want to say in this regard. I mean, mm. it's like, this says what I want to say. Um, the the only thing, well, I'll, I'll just tell you my next project that I'm working on is uh, what we call an oratorio. So it's sort of like a, a mini opera, but where there's no like people walking around, there's no action and staging and sets. It's just like you get on stage with a chorus and an orchestra and some solo singers and they, yeah. they, they tell a story. So like Handel's Messiah is the perfect example of an oratorio. Uh, Stravinsky did a version of Oedipus Rex and that's that's an oratorio. So there's a lot of stuff with like early you know mythology and stuff. And and the uh, the subject that I'm gonna do as, as this oratorio project is the subject of Cassandra, who is a, uh, a an ancient Greek prophetess, and her whole thing was that um, she was given the gift of foresight, but then she was cursed because she rejected the love of Apollo. She was cursed to never be believed. So here she is mm. predicting the the fall of Troy and the uh, the Trojan horse and like all of these terrible things, you know, people who were going to die and they all died, and she was correct about everything, but nobody believed her. And to me, that is very much. I mean, so of course, you can interpret that a hundred different ways, mm. but my personal interpretation is like, oh my God, people listen to me. It's like, you know, I, I'm telling you the truth. Like veganism is yeah, like yeah. the way and antinatalism is, you know, what, what we should all be doing. Um, so there's something that is contained in there that sort of has to do with like my personal relationship with trying to, you know, cause I mean, it's like, you know, you, you never convince a person to go vegan. It just like, it barely ever happens. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you think that like, you know, once you've been sort of green pilled, right? You think that oh, all I have to do is tell people why this makes sense, but it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, and, and that's when you become a misanthrope. You just have to kind of get over it. But I want to, I want to uh, infuse that frustration, those personal frustrations, into a piece of music that mm. um, people can read a lot of different ways. Because we all have our personal frustrations, and we think that we're we're right about everything, and nobody's listening to us. So. I guess that's a little bit of, but, but other, other vegan antinatalist projects, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to it, but I don't have any specific, um, plans in mind. Mm. And do you, do you think, um, that you are the first ever vegan antinatalist composer or do you know of any others or? That's an interesting question. I mean, um, so <laughs> the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer was very, influential in the 19th mm. century and uh f most famously with wagner who became a vegetarian because of um because of schopenhauer um but of course he wasn't vegan and uh but there are other composers who might have been antinatalists i mean they were certainly bachelors and they didn't have kids like brahms for example was very influenced by schopenhauer um but I don't know if, like, he just didn't have kids. Like, there's no way to say mm. that like, he thought. Yeah, was yeah, I get you. To the world. Um, however, the, I, I think uh, I think that there there might be like anonymous vegan antinatalist composers, but it's probably not who you're thinking of. I'm thinking of like 14th century monks, you know, who who were like. <laughs> You know, they certainly were not having kids, and yeah, yeah. a lot of them live vegetarian lifestyles. And maybe they wrote mm. some like Gregorian chant or something like that. But I, I think that uh, I'm probably the only one who puts those labels on themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, I get what you mean because, um, like, the further you go back in time, the harder it is to one know how the person, what the person believed, and how they tangent, like, how they practically lived, but also like they probably didn't have the same conceptions of the ideas as we do now, you know, so if like, for example, you know, just the terms themselves, like antinatalism and veganism have both come around, like in historical terms, like very recently, like, a, you know, like last second, like they're both very recent. Um, and in even just having a term for something can, can, can change like your understanding of it. Um, so I get that from a historical um, like angle. It would be interesting, you know, if there's any other composers alive that it's it's one of those things because both veganism and, and antinatalism they're both two things that it's very easy, especially in like non-Western parts of the world. Because I think in the West we can maybe be a bit more open about controversial beliefs that we may have, but. Um, like there are many places in the world where, you know, you just, you would just keep it to yourself. You wouldn't you know, you know, say, you know, you wouldn't 
make it public that you have these beliefs. So it could be the case that there are some sort of like closeted um, vegan antinatalist composers, but you know, we just don't, we aren't aware of them. Um, no. Well, and if, if there's any watching, then <laughs> comment below. Please, yeah, get, <laughs> yeah, get at yeah. me. I, I would happen. I, I mean, look, vegan antinatalists. I mean, that's we're talking about a very small group of people. Here. Yeah. And classical composers are like a super <laughs> tiny uh, number of people. My guess would be that if there are vegan antinatalists who are expressing themselves in music out there, they're probably in like metal bands, you know? Um, yeah. Th- that just seems like a more, uh, somehow a more natural uh, setting for, for that kind mm. of, um, you know, uh, p- positioning. Um, mm. But, you know, it, it, one interesting thing about Almari is that like, you always read this about him that he's still read and like memorized by school kids in the Middle East, you know, in Arabic speaking countries. And I'm just mm. like, I wonder which poems they're <laughs> they're reading. I mean, it's probably not the ones that I chose, you know, it's probably like some more poetic stuff. Or because I mean, from what I understand from Kevin is that like he's very adept with the Arabic language. He's he's, mm. you know, like that's something that he's still a thousand years later considered such a great uh mm. you know user of that of that tongue and just like like in the way that we would, you know, interpret Shakespeare or something like that. Mm. Um but but yeah, and and you know, I would say that for that reason, I applaud you. I mean, you had the young lady from from uh, Algeria on your channel, right? I mean, yeah, 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 Fatima. Yeah. So it is it is interesting. I mean, of course, there's people out there. You know, I'm sure that there's many people across the world, and and probably most of them um, do not have an outlet to even, and, and probably don't even know some of the terms. You know, even it's mm. like it's like Almari. I'm sure you know. It's like Kevin said. He he probably just came upon this stuff independently. And you've got mm. to figure that throughout history, so many people have come up with this same wisdom uh, just by, you know, reasoning it out. But then, of course, there's yeah. a whole Buddhist tradition that that mm. really does teach this. And there are some early strands of Christianity that are pretty antinatalist, too. I mean, yeah, I've heard about this. And I think, um, uh, the, do you know uh, Theophile de Garot? No, I don't think so. He's, um, I, I think he's Belgian, but he's written a book uh, on christian antinatalism and sort of like the history of that and you know um you know how they're sort of how they interpret christianity in a way that leads them to antinatalism and i i haven't read it um but if that's something that people are interested in then then there is a book on that and yeah with with al mari like i just find him so impressive because um maybe maybe you you'll know about him way better than me so correct me if anything i'm about to say is wrong but from what i understand like he was blind from a very early age right so that is you know that's going to stunt how you can learn um and he from my understanding i don't know if this was in his entire life or just in later life but he he led a relatively secluded life he lived he lived in in a in a cave <laughs> yeah. for i don't know how long of of his life. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, what the sort of like the standard of the cave was. I mean, maybe it had been decked out a bit, you know, maybe they'd put like a mud front on it or something, <laughs> but yeah, he, he, he just strikes me as a very, um, in, like impressive person to have something like veganism, antinatalism, something resembling atheism maybe, or maybe just sort of a general deism or something like these are all things that are generally, and on being on top of that, being blind. So missing one of your key sensory perceptions, like these are all things that are like controversial or can hold you back in today's day where we have much more technology. People are generally much more open. So it's just so impressive that he was like one able to just navigate that world but also be remembered for so long it's it's really impressive yeah i agree entirely i mean and and everything you say about his biography as far as i understand is correct i think that he was Mm. blinded by smallpox at age four um and then as a young man like i said he he went to baghdad which was like you know the cultural capital of the arabic world and he he like he tried to really make a name for himself, but he was sort of rejected and he wouldn't sell his poetry. That was like a big thing for him. Um, and then he came back sort of a bit defeated from there. And then he lived out the rest of his life in this cave. So I, I think we're talking for several decades because he had a relatively mm. long life. I think he lived into his 70s or 80s. 
If um, I'm like, I'm assuming you're way more well read on Almari than I am. If if there is, if someone wants to learn a bit more about Almari and his, you know, his sort of um, his like thoughts and writings, what would what would you direct someone to? What's your sort of personal favorite place to read him? I would say that there's a few uh, good sources. One is the uh, the the original. Um, translations which come from a book uh god i can't it's i think it's called studies in islamic poetry and they're by uh reynolds nicholson as i think that 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 original translator's name Mm. um and like i say you can find that on archive.org anybody in the world can read that for free and there is a a decent biographical sketch of almari it's not just a straight book of translations of the poetry he 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 talks Mm. about and he translates some other poetry too um but really, uh, and there are a couple other small English language books about Amari that I've read that, you know, and they have some some alternate translations. None of them is particularly good, I would say. Um, the best source that I would say is um, uh, reading uh, Kevin Blankenship's uh, scholarly articles, which are very well written. You don't you don't have to be like an it's not thick in academies, you know, mm. Um if you can get your hands on those either through like JSTOR or some other, you know, uh, academic portal, um, try to read them because he, he writes very well uh, and, and coherently about Amari. And there are some of, uh, he, there are some translations of other Amari poems that he does just, you know, in the course of writing those papers, um, mm. of his, that he's translated himself and they're very good. Yeah, I will. I'll try and find links to all that stuff. And if if you have links, I think to I have some links. To hand, I'll, I'll send yeah, them to you. Yeah, yeah, and I'll include them in the description <laughs> so anyone can um can like just you know find them easily. Um, but if you know if someone wants to like follow your work or just find out more about you, um, wh- where can where can people go to 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 do that? Then go to my website, which is willcwhite dot com. Uh, they can follow me on Twitter if Twitter continues to exist <laughs> at Will <C>. White. <laughs> uh they can yeah I, I mean i have instagram i have all the things so um i'm, I'm pretty easy to find really and, and, cool. and my youtube channel i would say you know yeah I'll, I'll link your website youtube channel and twitter in there and then you know if people want to find instagram and other things then i'm sure they'll yes. find them through those yeah that's right. um but yeah thank you so much for coming on um it's been like really interesting to talk to you because i to be honest when i first started doing conversations with people i never thought i'd be talking to a composer because that is just like a world that I don't have any overlap with. Isn't the world a strange place? And you know, the internet, what an amazing thing. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, like I say, I found your your channel just through, you know, YouTube recommendations. And I started watching your videos. And I was like, oh, this guy's really, you know, I I, I like your um, your approach to, to delivering the message. I think it's quite excellent. In addition to just the interviews, I, I've, I've found your, um, your, you know, content videos quite excellent so bravo to you on those and thank you for the work yeah, you're thank- doing. no thank you thank you um yeah i will try and keep doing it for as long as i can um yeah but thank you for coming on it's been like really interesting and i just f- for anyone who has forgotten the whole point of the conversation um <laughs> there is the piece that will has composed so um i'll link it below uh, go and listen to it if you haven't listened to it already um it, it's it's yeah it's um it's really nice i i really enjoyed it um and like i said i don't i hardly ever listen to classical music um so i think it has reached outside of people who would traditionally listen to classical music as well um but yeah thank you for coming on it's been great to speak to you thank you